What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Like I always say, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. Got a brother on that's done a bunch of time, been in some places in the feds that nobody really wants to go, like the SMU program. I see this brother got out of prison, man, he owns his own company, doing good things. But you know what? We're going to let him tell his story. Josh, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and... Let's get into it. Well, I'm originally from New Jersey. I uh, was born there. Uh, lived there for a couple of years. You know, got into you know the little little problems as a teenager. Uh, went into like programs or like you know from detention centers. Uh, went to programs in New York. Uh, stayed in New York for a little bit over in Brooklyn. Uh, moved out of there maybe about 17. Went to Philadelphia and lived in Philadelphia uh, for a while. And, um, you know, just that entire experience, just being in those particular cities was just, uh, it's, a, it's a rude awakening, you know. Um, but right now I'm doing, you know, I did 12 years in the feds. Uh, got locked up in uh, beginning of 06, got out 2017. Uh, five years of supervised release and I'm done this December, finally. I want to talk a little bit about your prison experience, right? You got you ended up doing 12 years. What was your sentence? My sentence was originally 120 months, which was only 10 years. And uh, I ended up getting another two in the SMOOTH program. Uh, it was with a knife shot and an assault. So they, they sent my shot to the feds, and the feds actually picked it up. So I uh, went over there to, uh, to court. And they just gave me another two years in, in federal court for that. Um, so I turned out to be close to 12 years. So, so let me ask you, are you comfortable swinging? Because some people might get dizzy, but it's all good. Uh, anyway, um, so you end up getting, you know, the 120 months. How old were you when you first got sentenced and what court was it in? I was in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and I was uh, still in my 20s, uh, 29, I would say. And what was the charge? Was six now. What was the charge? Was it a felon in possession of a firearm? Yeah, it was a nine twenty four C, nine twenty four C uh, felony in felony possession in a crime of violence. It was aiding and abetting. Uh, it was a robbery. Uh, it was also um, the Hobbs Act, interstate commerce. And I went to trial. It took me two years. I went to trial. They were trying to give me uh, forty five years. 45 years. 45 years. See, a lot of people don't know that, you know, when you go do a robbery and you get caught with a gun or you use a gun in the robbery, if you just have a gun on you, you don't even have to pull it out. That's five years. If you brandish the gun, that's seven years. If you discharge the weapon, that's 10 years. That's the mandatory minimum all the way up to life. They can give you 30 years for a 924 C. Easy. Easy. So you go to trial, you end up losing, and now you get sentenced to 10 years. How old were you when you were sentenced? I'm 29. I'm 29, and I got out in my 40s. So. 29 years old, and you're on your way to federal prison. What's the first prison you go to? The first prison was Allenwood. They tried to keep me closest to my dis my district, and they kept me in the Philadelphia area. But you know, it, Allentown was uh, now Allenwood was the best one to uh, the closest one from home that they could send me to. Was that at the FCI or the Pen? The Pen. So you go to Allenwood Penn. I mean, there's been some trouble. There's been some serious shit that happens there. I had Jimmy Mack on. He did some violent shit in the gym over there. But, you know, a lot of people are like, damn, man, I wish I went to Allenwood instead of Big Sandy. They got weights over there. But there's still a lot of violence there, right? Yeah, it can be <clears throat> all. Uh, the yard is basically, it, it's half the size of a regular USP. It's only one side. And then they have the yard. So it, it's still... Things happen, but it's it's usually it's not really with the politics. It's just with the uh, new, a lot of the new guys that come in. They just don't know how to conduct themselves. They're just really green to the system, and they have to jump in with the car, you know. And sometimes you have these young guys just just mess up, you know. And uh, but like a lot of the politics is that if they are extremely out of hand, then their car has to handle it before it elevates into something else, you know. And who do you end up running with when you get there? 
Uh, I was running with the Kings. The same on the same on the street, and that's just how they had me labeled. They, you know, that's what they put all in my profile on my case. So everywhere I went, that that's just what it was, you know. So it was a lat. I mean, all right. So they allege. We'll say they allege. They yeah. allege you were a Latin king in the street. Yeah. Was the robbery connected to the Latin Kings? Was it kind of a Latin King robbery type of thing, or? Well, it it's, it was really. <clears throat> There, there were other indictments that happened prior to all of this. There was a, a huge Latin King indictment out of New York, Philadelphia, Jersey, uh, St. Louis, Miami. And they were just pulling people from everywhere. So uh, these guys, a lot of these guys are already in prison. So as you know, a lot of guys cooperate. Some people take plea, plea deals. So they bring me into the indictment. And you end up, you're in federal prison, you're running with the Kings. You get in any trouble at Allenwood? You get transferred from there? What's going on in Allenwood? Well, in Allenwood, it was a dispute, you know, it, it, uh, it, it kicked off over in the education department. Uh, something was stolen in the education department, and uh, it was stolen from, you know, one of, one of the Kings. And we, they were trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, there was also a dispute amongst amongst the kings. I'm not sure if you know about the you know Chicago and New York kind of separation with that, but it was a lot of uh, power seeking like within that. So one sector moved a specific way on someone. They just took everybody in. You know they locked all the kings up. We were on lockdown for close to maybe close to over a month, and. Um, they started searching cells before we could even get into the cell. They, they closed the unit. Before we went to the unit, all the all the doors were locked, so we couldn't even get in our room. Let That's me. when they started conducting the searches. They started finding knives. They found hooch. They found all kinds of things in everybody's room. Uh, they found two knives in my room. They found uh, even a razor that I used to shave. I put them on the comb and I trim my beard. You know. And they tried to with everything, all the weapons, in, in my cell. So. Let me ask you this. You know, you talked a little bit about the New York, Chicago factions. I mean, you know, usually, man, when, you, when you're in a prison, there's Latin kings. Them dudes are always sticking together. They go hard for each other. You know, it's like a respect thing. You know, I was close with a couple dudes. One of the dudes, man, I ended up doing his legal work. He was out of Boston. And uh, he ended up getting out of jail eight years early. He went to Puerto Rico, and unfortunately, man, he got killed over there, bro. But he was a full-fledged, like, hardcore, you know, I, you know, Latin king, man. He was going hard for his people. And, uh, you know, usually them dudes are, you know, well, some people might say they're arrogant, but they definitely go hard. What was the power struggle, though? Why was there a power struggle? Just the way that the, the organization, it's set up different than it is in New York than it is in Chicago. Uh, it was founded in, in in Chicago, but as it branched off, it also the faction of it also started in New York. So it's 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 kind of the same guidelines, but as far as like uh, what we're supposed to learn, as far as the, there's different lessons that we have to understand, and they are they're particularly different from what Chicago uh, teaches and what New York teaches. So. Uh, the arrogance, I see that because it's like, you know, Chicago people like some of the kings in Chicago feel a little bit better than the, than the kings in New York. Some of the kings in New York feel a little bit better than the kings in, in Chicago. But, you know, when it comes down to the yard and something kicks off, all of that is dead. Everybody's riding together and they know it. You know, so, uh, but SIS always tries to find some type of division, you know, uh, and they, they cause a lot of issues, and I've seen it. And um, yeah, it, it it can it can go down. From, it goes from a zero to hundred sometimes, you know, in some of these places. Would you call? Would you say you were kind of like a wild dude back then? Well, when I first went into the penitentiary, I was more, I was quieter and just trying to observe. I was with my car, and then I observed what was going on. Um, I became really good friends with a friend of mine uh, over there in Hollywood, John Stanford. 
and all of his co-defendants. So we walked the yard a lot, and you know, we talked a lot. And um, he's a really good dude, you know, a mob dude, um, you know, allegedly, I would say. <laughs> but uh, and he, he was telling me about his case that you know, uh, even his co-defendants, they all they offered them all thirty years, and they said no. He would not allow any of his court defendants to take it. He said, we're going to trial. And um, they went to trial. They lost. They all got life. And the 30 years was just about coming up. They would have been out. Uh, so a lot of people need to realize that, you know, uh, when it comes to shot callers or, you know, uh, a cop or whatever, when they say something has to be done a certain way, it's, it's just it is what it is. You know, you, you don't call the rules. You, you can't. You know, you, you just fall in suit. Let's um, let's talk a little bit about the shot caller thing and the Latin Kings, right? You know, what was it like for you to have someone telling you what to do? I mean, you had a shot caller, right? Works like that. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. Did you feel funny when a dude told you, "Hey, man, you got to go do this"? In your mind, how do you feel in your mind? Like, yeah, do you want to do it for the car? For the you know, for the Almighty Latin King Nation? I mean. What's going through your mind? We're like, yo, you got to go do this, or you got to, you know, you got to hold these knives. What are you thinking in your mind? Yeah, because I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Because me being the new guy on the yard, they automatically placed me on security. So I, I got to hold the knives. I got to find places for them. I got to put them in certain spots where everybody knows where they're at. So when it kicks off, everybody can grab them. So uh, the first thing that comes in my head is like, man, I came in here with 10 years. And uh, you know that they can give you more time for each night. But you're thinking, well, you know, um, what you sign up for, That's it. It, it's not something you can just get away. You just have to basically intellectually smart when it comes to just doing what you need to do, you know, and just hope for the best. You know, it, there is no... <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can do. You, you know? got to hope for the best, man. I hope I don't get caught doing this shit right here. But yeah. they told me I got to do it. I got to do it. If you don't do it, are there repercussions? If you're like, nah, I'm not doing that, bro. Well, I mean, it, it depends. <clears throat> I mean, uh, you get violations. You know what I mean? But it, it, it's like like a, like a little beat down or whatever. But, you know, it, it's not nothing that's like unbearable where, you know, you're going to like they make you check in or nothing. It's, it's not like that. You know, especially with a new guy coming in, it was a little bit different. It's like, look, this is how this works. Until you get, you know, lined up and, and figure out everything, then, you know, uh, uh, we'll work from there. You know, I just had a guy on my show that I was friends with, John Powers, right? John Jack Powers. He did 22 years in solitary confinement, I think 33 years straight in the feds. And he spent all that time locked in the cell. Eventually, you end up in the smooth program over that knife, right? Oh, I actually ended up in the smooth program uh, from Coleman. That was another USP in Coleman one. Uh, that was an act, another active yard and uh, it kicked off uh, in the yard with, uh, there was some the Pisas actually killed a guy in the yard. And uh, this was at Coleman, this was at Coleman one or Coleman two? Coleman one. Coleman two at that time was a dropout yard. Okay. And then Coleman, Coleman One was an active yard. I don't know what it is now, but like the, when I left the feds, Coleman Two was like a like a dropout yard, and then Coleman One was the active yard. So what happens over there? You guys get into it with the Pisces? No, it wasn't. It wasn't with the Pisces. It was. Uh, it had something to do with the DC guys. Uh, the DC guys were going into like right after the lockdown, after the guy died, you know, that's how I started the invest investigation to check pull everybody out of the cell one by one and try to ask him all these questions. And so they kind of like, uh, slowly you graduate back to normal again, you know, one hour downstairs, one hour upstairs and everybody goes to the shower. So, uh, there was a DC guy that I'm not even sure what the fight was about, but, there was one of a Latin King and a uh, thing, a Peace Stone, were sold up together because they 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 run closely knit in, in certain uh, facilities. 
and the DC guy got it, got into it with the uh, the peace stone, and uh, the DC guy went into the the peace stone's room, and they were arguing. Well, my brother went in and was like, "Look, look, not nah, look." It's like all this, like in, in our cell, you draw a lot of attention. I got like uh, he had like some stuff in there, that, you know, like hooch. He was gonna make yeah. hooch, sugar, and all that. So it's like, nah, you're making the spot hot. Y'all got to go. So the, the DC guy might started, you know, mouthing off or whatever, and uh, call it how it is, man. Call it how it is. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, he, he 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 left and went and said, "Well, I'll come back. I'm just gonna go get my knife." So he goes up, he goes up to the second floor, and the, they call me over and said, look, get ready. I was like, oh, shit. They used to give me the sign, I was like, oh, shit. You can, you can feel the tension on the block. They can be, it can be people screaming and yelling, but when you know something's about to kick off, you feel it. You can tell. Everybody's kind of quiet, everybody's looking a particular way. And you know, everybody's strapping up. Nobody knows what's going to go down. Because if it really gets set off, all these little beef that other people had, they can handle it right then and there. You know, so you don't know what's going to kick off. So the DC guy, he, he goes up there and he starts talking to, uh, I guess his shot called from the block. And he's just, he's just going off and going off and he's, he's talking and he's, he comes out with a towel wrapped up. And next thing we know, we see a couple other guys with their, with their towels coming out their cell. And you know how the, the pen is. Those boots on, stay on. You know, so we're, we're, we're suited and booted, you know. We got our own boots. And uh, everybody just got ready. You know, uh, I behind the uh, washer and dryer, we just started pulling shit out from everywhere. Um, it, it kicked off pretty bad that day, man. Kicked Let's, off pretty bad. They just locked. That was just a unit thing. So they locked, still locked the prison down. But everybody in that unit was sent to the shoe, awaiting transfer. Uh, I heard there were a couple of charges. There was like assaults, a lot, a lot of assaults they charged people with. The, the, uh, they sent the shots straight to the beds, and they went from there. You know, you say you say things kicked off, and people are watching the show, and we can't just be like, "Hey, things kicked off." People want to know what happened. You know, this, you know, this is prison life. I mean, are, are you guys out there stabbing each other? So, you know, people are going to want to know, like, what really jumped off. I mean, are people over there stabbing each other? I mean, hitting people with locks. What's going on? What's it like when something like that's kicking off? A lot of adrenaline. Uh, and, and just finding that, that, that point kind of in your equilibrium to stay calm. Because you know that once you panic, uh, you it may not go well. So uh, <clears throat> we usually group up, you know, back to back, two of us back to back, and we'll have our knives, you know, or, or whatever we have. And everybody go in pairs, and we and we just strap up that way, you know, and uh, that way everybody has each other's back. Nobody can, you know, stab us from the back of us or anything. So uh, it. It's kind of, it, everything just happens so fast. You know, um, what really makes it just sink in is that when you actually see that, like, your boots are slipping on that, that floor because of just the blood, you know, how slippery that, that blood can be, you know, and uh, it was just, like, everywhere. I mean, uh, guys upstairs were just bleeding. There were guys with locks, but they had them on their shoelaces. You know, and the socks, people, you hit somebody with, a, with a, a lock in a sock, once it breaks through the sock, it's just going to fly somewhere. You ain't going to find it. And you're hit. I mean, that's why you got to tie it. You got to tie it on there. You tie it on the lock. Yeah. You know what I mean? And even, yeah. I've seen people hitting people with that, and they hit them so hard, the actual, the lock top, that opens, and there goes the lock anyway. Yeah. So if you're hitting someone with that lock and these people got a knife and that thing comes off, now you're you're definitely at a disadvantage, so to speak, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I got to ask you this question. And there's people on here that got mad at me the other day and they must not have watched the whole video where they're like, oh, you be hating on DC dudes. No, I don't. I don't hate on anybody. No, I no, just, you know, I, I've met a lot of really good DC dudes, you know, it, it, and it's really not their fault that, you know, some of their... Uh, some of their guys are just out of pocket, you know. 
And uh, it, it's hard to keep some of these guys in line because a lot of them come in with this chip on their shoulder. So when they get into the car and the DC guys are like, look, you can't do this, you can't do that. They got a chip on their shoulder with their own people. You know, so like you can you can usually see when 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 that could be with anybody, you know, any car. You know, sometimes you just get those firecrackers that come in and you just don't know when they're gonna set shit off. So And you know, a lot of times, man, you know, in all cars, but you know, I've seen this in Raybrook. They had a young DC dude over there was disrespectful, troublemaker. And you know what, man? Eventually the DC dudes kept telling him, like, yo, listen, man, stop doing this shit, man. Yo, you gotta be easy, man. And eventually they ended up getting them and they got them out of there. That was at an FCI. Yeah. But, you know, I've been around a lot of good dudes. One of the dudes I talked about in the video the other day, Mario. Mario just got killed at um, USP Pollock. Did like 33 years. Had like 30-something years in and now, you know, he gets murdered. I think he was 55 years old. He's gone. He's dead. Big dude, man. Respectful dude. You know, a small incident over a telephone leads to his death. So on that day, when that stuff's going on, you got a 10-year sentence. Are you thinking, damn, I might have to kill someone or I might get killed right now? Honestly, I just thought it was all over. You know, I, I, I just thought that, that that was it. You know, um, I, I didn't think I was going to walk out of here. We all numbered. You know, um, there was only about four, you know, P-Stones. It was about eight of us just on that unit alone. And it's not like, you know, like other people from the car can just walk in there. There's no move. Doors are locked. So you're, you're stuck in there for the next move. So uh, it, 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 it's hard to define exactly what you feel. It's just, it, it's fight or flight, you know? You're either going to get out of there or you know you're not. So you, you kind of find this confidence to just say, look, if this is it, this is it. I'm just going to go out with a bang, you know? But, uh, so let's keep it real, man. Who wins, the Latin Kings and the Peace Stones or the DC dudes? Well, uh, Seal hits the deuces. It's still going off. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen the Seals get, get booted and, and, and suited up that fast. Uh, first thing I heard was the concussion bomb. I thought, me being there, I, I, it, I thought they were coming in there, you know, letting off shots to clear everything. I hear this huge concussion bomb. My ears are ringing. And I'm thinking, they, the, the CEOs are in there shooting, you know, getting people down. Um, nobody heard the yelling when, when the CEOs told everybody to get on the ground, nothing, because everybody's still on that, that fight or flight move, you know. The concussion bomb kind of puts everybody back into perspective to say, you know, okay, what's going on? You know, um, I was choking on the gas. They sprayed the whole first floor. Didn't really reach the second floor. Uh, the seals just came in with the shields. They just started separating people and putting the shield on top of them, uh, putting their, their knee in the back of my neck. And they were, it didn't look like, I didn't even think that many seals could get to that door at one time. But there's also the back alleyway that they come in through that I never knew about. The, uh, there's, as you know, like the way that a lot of USPs are built, there's an actual hallway that goes behind the units. So they're coming out of doors from there, too. So they came from everywhere. <coughs> a lot of people don't know about that. But when I was in Big Sandy, I knew because we used the back hallway sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you this. Did you end up getting stabbed? Are you hit? <clears throat> I got stabbed on my, right on my, my lower abdomen on the right side. Uh, <clears throat> How many times they stab you? What was that? How many times did they stab you? That was just one. You only got that hit once. One, that was just one time. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I got hit. I, I didn't even feel it. Um, it must have been like as I tried to get off the steps and, and it looks like somebody tried to go between the railing. You know how the steps are? They just like somebody just tried to get me off trying to go up the steps. Um, my cell was down there. I was just trying to get upstairs, uh, trying to get like the leverage to have them have to come up. It's easier to get them trying to come up than, you know, get some leverage that way. Um, but I guess I was too close to the railing. Somebody got me right on my lower abdomen. And, so you, uh, It wasn't that serious. It wasn't that serious. So, 
let me ask you this. Your thought process is what? I'm going to stand at the top of the steps, and as they come, I'm hitting them to keep them down. Are you thinking in your mind? And look, I'm going to keep it real, right? I, I was involved in something in Big Sandy where I'm like, I'm out here fighting for my life, and for real, I'm hoping that the cops get there to stop this shit before it's before it's too late. That's what I was thinking. I'm keeping it real with you. Were you thinking I'm going to stand at the top of these steps until these cops get here and stab as many people as I can until, you know, or unless they get me? I, uh, I forgot how many of us there were, but as the DC dudes came down the steps, they all came down the steps, and they tried to block the steps from people going up, so they were in front of it. But as everything kicked off, there was an actual a way to get back up the steps. So I forgot who was behind me or who was next to me, but we used those steps as leverage because we had the reach, we had the advantage, we can kick, and we can. they try to grab us, we can stab, but we didn't have the sides covered. I mean, I, I didn't, so I, that's that's why I got hit. That was my mistake. I didn't stay close to the center of those steps. So, <clears throat> And you go to the hole after this, right? How long are you in the hole? Oh, God. I would say close to four months. They first, first day, I wasn't sure if they were sending my shot to the feds or what they were doing. So kind of like with the investigation, it, just, it even took us close to maybe about a month to get a shot. So then when the shots came, only a couple guys got shots. And then a couple of days later, they started giving out the other shots with the, with the, uh, with the criminal number on top, the docket number for a new case. For, that means the feds took it. So uh, I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't get that sent to, to the feds. They just gave me a shot, you know, the knife shot. And, uh, you know, fighting knife. They didn't give me a, a O2. They just, cause I guess when they look at the cameras, they, they're kind of, uh, they, they see what happens. So, I, so Sometimes they charge you on, on what they saw. Sometimes if they just want to be, you know, assholes, then they're going to just stack up the, all these shots up, you know. Um, but. Yeah. And eventually you end up going to the smooth program, right? Yeah. Yeah. And earlier you talked about fight or flight. I mean, those are the two natural instincts, right? But as a Latin king, you're not allowed to take flight. You have to handle that business, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's all you have to do is fight. That, that's all you can do. You know, uh, uh, like you mentioned, I believe, like earlier on, uh, someone had to check in because he didn't, you know, he ran from a situation that, you know, he should have. You know, you have to be there. You know, you, everybody is it's like a link. So everybody is supporting everybody. Even if they don't get along with, with, with or agree with any of the issues, that, whatever. But when it comes to, to that type of situation, everybody's linked up together in the car and everybody's doing hard, you know. You know, the viewers watch this. People that haven't been in federal prison, you know, they got that misconception. Some people, I mean, people are starting to learn. That federal prison is a nice place. It's sweet time. But what they don't understand, I mean, they're probably watching these shows. They're like, damn, these dudes are all fighting each other. Why? And why do you think we fight each other instead of sticking together, man? That might be a tough question, but what do you think it comes from? And then I'll answer it, too. I personally, I, I think it comes from a lot of separation that's already instilled in the prison. Uh, as you know, I mean, uh, they would not put a black guy in the same cell as a white guy. They just won't, they won't do that in a penitentiary. You know, uh, that separation that they have there, and I understand because there's the prison politics that they want to abide by. But, you know what, uh, it, it doesn't seem that people actually want to get along. You know, and as you know, in prison, everybody's still trying to make money. Whether there's, you know, it's the K2, whether they got a table, a gambling table, you know, whether they sell a couple of trees here and there, whether they got the K2 on lock or whatever it is they got. So I think that is the main issue that, you know, causes a lot of problems within the prisons is the drugs and the gambling. And, you know, uh, people do fall very far in debt, you know, in prison. And, and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, we're prisoners. We don't have money. What are we gambling? Is it for? You know, books and stamps. I and mean, we got stamps. We got commissary. We got, that's our money is our stamps. You know, flat books are just like the loose 
stamps, you know, wrap them up in little rubber bands. I mean, that, that's our money. And people need to find some type of hustle, and if they get into, you know, these, these situations where, you know, uh, it's over stamps, drugs, it's uh, disrespect, they can, sometimes it's something simple, which is somebody just, like you said before, just not wiping down that microwave. You know, uh, uh, they could be one shot caller that's going to use it next and he feels disrespected because he knows he's the shot caller and he feels disrespected the guy left the microwave like that right after he was going to use it. So, so let me answer it too. Let anything me, let, can happen. Sometimes. Anything can happen. But, you know, I think a lot of it comes from ignorance from, you know, people taking small things and turning them into big, big things because we have nothing else to do in there except for, People are angry. People got life sentences, 30, 40 years. People have, you know, a chip on their shoulder, like, man, psh, just angry about everything. And all it takes is like, let's say, you know, and I'm not, I don't know the whole situation, but the DC dude or whatever, he's in the cellar arguing. Your brother goes out, like, yo, bro, you got to, you know, be respectful, man. Take that outside. I got shit going on here. And now this dude takes it the wrong way. Like, man, you disrespected me when really we're arguing and fighting each other over a bunch of nothing when we should be sticking together for a common good. I don't know if you know, but. You may have been there when it happened. They took all the microwaves out. So, yeah. Excuse washers, me. Washers, dryers, all of that. They took the washers and dryers out. Now you send your clothes to laundry. It comes back. It smells like cat piss. We no longer have microwaves. And in federal prison, food is comfort in prison. You know, but we never come together, man, to say, hey, and now I'm not promoting this in a violent way, but come together and say, look, man, stand for something or fall for anything. But we're too busy fighting each other in there, right? Yeah. And, and, the main reason why they took the, the microwaves, uh, I believe, where was it? I think that was, I think that was Coleman or Hazleton. I'm not sure. I forgot where it was. It might have been Big Sandy. But I remember the story because the guy was the guy was in the ADX with me. I don't know what an ADX an ADX or the, you said ADX. Do you mean the SMU program? No, ADX, ADX. I got shipped from from the smooth to the ADX. Where this was when I was at, at the smooth. Some kicked off in the yard and dude got butchered. I got that's where I got my my, my extra two years. We're gonna and talk about that. We'll get there. Go ahead. Finish the story. Sorry for interrupting you. All right. The main reason why they took those microwaves was because there was one inmate. He's walking by with his cup of coffee. Well, he's going to put his coffee in the microwave. And uh, a CEO was very, as a lot of CEOs sometimes are, very respectful when, they, when they're on that unit. Uh, he says, good morning. So the inmate just looks at him. It's like, you not don't talk to an inmate when he's by himself. You know, I mean, there, there are rules to that. You know, uh, it makes it look like he's telling the CEO something and everybody's just looking. You know, so the CEO shouldn't have done that. He was a new guy, but you don't try to talk to an inmate by himself unless someone is there because that's just the rules when you're in the car. You know, that that's just the way the politics runs there. Uh, this way, they even if it doesn't make you look like you're trying to pass some information on to anything that's going on. That's why they always have that buddy where you're, if you're near the CEO, you got to go and ask for toilet paper or whatever. You got to have somebody with you. So the CEO, he just looked at him, didn't say anything. So I did, like, people took it a, a certain way. So he said, all right. The CEO goes into the office. He's on talking on the phone. Who knows who? He goes back into his cell, gets some baby oil. Uh, I guess he got a glass, uh, some type of jar or something to put it in. And he started heating up the baby oil. And he's just in there back and forth. You know, it gets it nice and hot. He calls the CEO. The CEO comes out. He splashes the hot, boiling hot baby with all over the CEO's face. Skin is just pouring off. He's screaming. He couldn't even hit the deuces. It was that and big. And, uh, that was that big Sandy. That was that big Sandy. Okay, I I because <clears throat> I remember when that happened. They told me about it, and I was like, so that's what happened. And. uh I mean, who knows what he was going through? You know, uh, uh, it, not just that, but, you know, if he had a, a, a 
bad conversation with his wife over the phone. You know, uh, these things escalate in, in, pris in prisoners' minds. You know, it just seems like all these things just start adding up. You know, you feel trapped. You feel like, what's, you know, what other route do you have? And then you have a CEO that does that, does not know any of the situation. And just, he doesn't even know he's escalating that. And, and it just, it just went off. You know, so. So now you end up in the SMOO program, right? Over this whole thing, the Latin King thing. You're in the SMOO program. What happens at the SMOO program that sends you to the ADX? And I would just want to clarify so people know, SMU is special management unit. It's a program. You're locked in a cell all day. You know, back then, I don't think you even got commissary. You know, it took a long time to earn commissary and all that stuff, right? Yeah, uh, when you first get there, you really don't, you don't get commissary. It's like you get a uh, level one and level two commissary slip, which is very minimal. It's like hygiene stuff. And if you do get anything that's food, it's like one candy bar, like uh, like one chip. So you got to get to three and level four in order to get the, the yellow sheet. Uh, when I was in it, it was four phases, one through four. Uh, I recently, like before I left, it's only three, which would make it, it's understandable because hardly anyone ever completed that program. And so I guess that's why they took, you know, one phase out of it. But, um... Yeah, it, that place was hell. It was the hottest place during the summer that I've ever been in, in my entire life. Where are you at, Lewisburg? Oh, God, yeah. Those cells are just so hot. I was over in B block, B1 and D3, and I was in B2. And old jail, just the bars on the window with the grate in the front, bugs everywhere. Guys just flooding their cells above you and just clogging their toilets, just shit coming down the walls. And just, that was, uh, that was an experience right there. That was technically the worst place I've ever been as far as prison was. This is what prison really is. I want people to hear that stuff. You get crazy people, they'll plug the toilet where it, they'll send shit through your toilet from their toilet all over the place just to be nasty. Some people are just crazy. You might be arguing with someone. Yo, man, you're being loud up there. Yeah, all right, watch this. They take a sheet, they tie it up, they send it down, they yank it, and now it jams the toilet. Now they can, you know, send piss, shit, everything down there on your floor. And this is the life that you're living in the SMOO program, man. Do you think that, I, I can see it, man, but I'm going to ask you. Do you think your prison experience affected you mentally and emotionally? I think it, it, it made me, it accelerated my awareness my surroundings, uh, how to read people a lot better. You know, I, there's not one naive bone in my body now. It's just very, very cautious, but you know, I know how to conduct myself in a way that you know can still be professional, but the body language, you know, if someone feels threatened or if someone just feels uncomfortable, these are things that you, know, you really pick up in, you know, in the penitentiary or in prison, depending on how you know uh, observant the person is or has to be, so it uh it it, it can also change you for the worse. Um, before they released me, they they sent me to to an FCI. They said that uh we can't we can't send you on your release from the penitentiary straight to a well. I was in I was getting out of the the uh. uh the ADX. So from the ADX, they could not send me back to the school to do a program and then send me out to the street. They said your, su your success rate just would not, it, it would not go. They stopped doing that. Uh, the counselor told me that they released someone from the penitentiary. He did, I don't know, I forgot how many years, but I think he did 20, 30 years. They released him from the, from the penitentiary and he was not able to function out there. He killed someone, I believe, like the first week he was out. Uh, so it was <clears throat> the prison politics and just you're just so used to being a certain way, always on the defense. Uh, you take, you always expect this respect, you know, and... Uh, That's our problem out here. That's our problem, Josh. We, you know, I got out here and I expected everyone to be respectful, you know? And I'm like, man, them yeah. people are, man, them people are disrespect, man. What they just, 
And 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 it, it, it is like that. Yeah. And I you know the incident that you're talking about. I don't know all the particulars, but I remember reading something when I was reading the John Powers stuff, where that dude got out of the ADX and went out there and bugged out. Um, but I do you know bef- you know we've been here a while. But let me ask you this: something kicks off at the Smooth program. You say someone gets butchered. Some people might not know what that means, and they might be like, "Well, what does he mean? And what happened?" So tell us what happened, and tell the people what butchering means. Well, I mean, this uh, is prison slang, butchering. You know, you get someone gets butchered. Well, I mean, if you take a cattle to the butcher shop, you know what's going to happen. A lot of people, you know, so it, it, it's it's the same term, <clears throat> you know. So you're basically just really just trying to cut someone open as, as badly as you can, where they're just, you know, I I, I don't want to be too obscene, but you know, their just guts are just hanging out everywhere. That means okay, you won. He's not getting up. That's it. It's done. So that is the goal when you really have to, you know, put that work in. Um, that that entire situation was that there was just, you know, someone uh, their paperwork wasn't right. Uh, you know how that is. It just, you know, they were asked at multiple, you know, facility, but different, you know, prisons to produce their paperwork, and they give you this anywhere from like a two week to maybe a month and a half grace period to, you know, bring you, get your paperwork. And uh, right before this individual, from what I heard, because I'm not, I, I don't know, I would just follow the orders, you know, so he would go to a penitentiary, they asked him to produce his paperwork, and he would check in right before, you know, they said, look, you got to get your paperwork, he would check in. Uh, and from my understanding, he did this at a lot of different penitentiaries. Was this person a Latin king, allegedly? Allegedly. Allegedly. So we, you know, it, it was an issue where the, we said, look, uh, uh, don't even worry about your paperwork. We looked it up. Everything's good. You know, so they rocked him to sleep, this and that. It's like, look, uh, it's like, you can't, you got to sell up with a brother. You can't sell up with anybody. Else. You have to, we have to stay together. So they, uh, they dropped me a kite and said, look, you know what it is, green light. So I well, it, it is what it is. I mean, it, it's not something that, you know, you can just say, okay, I'm not going to do it. Even though you're in a cell, you don't really have to. I could just check in and say, well, I'm not going to do it. But, you know, just with my status alone with going to trial, not saying I, all my 302 has everything in it. Everything was good, you know, uh, docket sheets, uh, all the transcripts, you know, everything was just good. So I already had that, um, that label bit, you know, I was solid all the way around. So I wouldn't, I'm not going to mess that up because basically in, in prison, what a lot of people fail to realize is that that's all you have is your word. You know, your lines and is really all that you have, uh, Nobody's in there just by themselves. So I had to do it in the yard so that everybody could see it. And uh, I wasn't sure if he was hip to it. He was still a little like sketchy about going outside, but we're in wreck cages. And they put about six people in at a time, you know, in different cages. So you can see other cages across and the ones that are next to you lined up together, but you can't really like nothing can kick off in there. The only thing they can kick off is what happens in that cage. So I go in there and I, I go to rec first. So they ask me to cuff up. I go and I cuff up. And uh, Sully, he goes and then he cuffs up. CEOs come out, they bring us and we walk down the back of uh, D block and walk down those back steps to go to the rec yard or to the rec cages. The cage next to us was, you know, some other, some other brothers on that side. They already had the knife out there. They brought it out there. So I, they put us both in the cage. There were already two guys in there inside the cage. And then I, I go in and then I go in first and then he goes in. And what's crazy is that people don't realize that the way that they have these cages set up is that initially, one person in there is still cuffed up. 
you know? So I go in, I get my cuffs off, and then I let him get his cuffs off. You know, it just, I'm, I'm not going like, to do it, do him that dirty. So, um, just, just happened fast. He was trying to do pull-ups off the side. He had his little towel. He had it wrapped up inside the grate, inside the cage. He was trying to do pull-ups. And, uh, one of the other brothers like, look, uh, I don't know why you're working out. You know what time it is, right? And he gets, and he gets down and he's like, and he's, eyes oh, just got big. You know, and that's where I just, I, I had to just, you know, I had to put that work in right then and there. And, uh, I, I guess the fear in his eyes kind of, it, it, it saddens you a little bit, you know, just, it's a different look that someone gives you when they have this feeling like, this is it. It's not like the, the feeling that everything's going to be okay. It's not the type of feeling. It, it's the type, it's the type of look that says, I'm never going to see my family. And you kind of feel a little sympathy there, but then you know you can't let up, you know, because the politics is politics. You got to do what you got to do. So it's either him or you, kind of, right? If you don't do it, you're hit too. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why they wanted they wanted it done outside. So let's know, inside the cage, nobody was getting involved. There were two other guys in the cage, and they were just, you know, they weren't even looking. They were just looking to the side, you he know. But uh, the seal walks by actually sees this happening, looks at me, and looks at him, and I'm just waiting for him to hit the deuces. And he goes, and he walks right back down the other side to go get the other CEOs bringing up the other two guys that were going to come in the cage. So I'm getting tired. I do my burpees, and I'm still getting it in, and I'm tired. I'm slipping on blood on the concrete, slipping, trying to stay, you know, uh, but the CO, I forgot how it, I forgot what happened from there. But when something like that kicks off, all the cages are quiet. Nobody's talking. Nobody's talking about their girl. Nobody's talking about their family. Nobody's talking about stamps. Nobody's talking about nothing. Everything's quiet. So the other CEOs that were bringing the ones, the other two down, they know something's up. They're trained for that. It's like those cages are too quiet. Deuces go off. Uh, they come, they, they come straight to the cage, they got the pellet gun, it shoots these uh, pellets, they freaking hurt like hell, and they just told everybody to get down, and I, I think the, 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 the scariest thing is that, you know, uh, you gotta, you don't want to grab the knife, they don't have a weapon, they're not going to shoot you in that cage, but they want you to, they want to be able to secure that weapon before they go in the cage, they want everybody on that floor. So, uh, that's what they did. I mean, they, they went in there, they told everybody to get down, they cuffed everybody up, they took the weapon. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that it happened that way because if I didn't what if I didn't put that work in, I just hit him maybe a couple times and he was still okay. The COs would have literally came, they, they would have asked us to throw the knife out of there and somebody would have had to cuff up and they would have asked me to cuff up. You know, and sometimes the seals would leave the knife in there and say, you cuff up, get over here and cuff up, and leave the other guy exposed to grab the knife and start hitting you while you're cuffed up. Let so me ask I, you, I, 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 go ahead, man, because I, I want to ask you some serious questions. Well, I mean, it, are you ready? Go ahead, go ahead. I'm ready for the next question. So you're, you're living, you know, you go to prison with 10 years, man. And you're involved in an organization, you know, some people call it a gang, some people call it an organization. And, you know, you signed up for this. And you have to ask, is this the most important thing in my life? Is this more important than my mother? Is this more important than my brother or my sister or my family or ever seeing my grandmother? Um, I don't know if you had kids before you went to prison, but I know you do now. Is this more important than your kids? I mean, those are the choices that you made. You had to make them and you made them, right? Because... It's not in the moment where you're thinking, you know, I love my mom more than I love this gang but or this organization. But in that moment, you have to be thinking it's not even about that. It's about it's kill or be killed. I have to do what I have to do. And you said that you had remorse, right? But was the organization 
Was the organization more important than your mother? Then it's not more important than, than my mother or my family. And, and, and they, they all know that, you know, because uh, uh, the way that they teach everybody to, you know, on, on, our, on how we should, you know, interact is that family always does come first. But when you're in that type of environment, it is, you know, that, you know, survival is the only way that we're getting out. You know, um, <clears throat> and not doing what you're told when, when you know, that, you know, is also just not an option. You know, so it, it's between, you're stuck between, a, you know, a rock and a hard place. You know, it, it's just, you just have to just, like I said, hope for the best and hope that everything works out the way that, you know, you actually get out of there, you know. Let me ask you this question. You said you've seen the fear in his eyes and in that moment you had some compassion. You know, after you do this, are you thinking this dude's dead? Do you think he died? He wasn't moving. I mean, I, they kept asking him to put his hands behind his back and he couldn't. So, um, I, I guess the only thing that, that I, once they took us back to the cell, you know, uh, they took me back to the cell and I'm in the cell by myself now. Um, I guess the biggest relief I had was when I heard the helicopter. Coming. You know, I can hear that helicopter coming in and I knew that, okay, he might make it because they're going to gonna fly out of there. So if he was, if he did not make it, then I would not have heard that helicopter come to get him and fly him out to the emergency unit. You know? Are you thinking when you're in the cell, like, wow, man, if he dies, I'm never getting out of prison. Does that enter your mind? It, it started running my mind as soon as it started cuffing me up. As soon as it started cuffing me up, it was running through my mind that, you know, I, you think of your family, you think of your, your kids, you think of your mom. I mean, uh, at that time, my mother and father already had passed away. They passed away a month apart from each other back in 2010. And this was while I was incarcerated. But I still had kids. I still had, you know, my sister. You know, I had my best friend, you know, that I grew up with since I was six years old, you know. Uh, and... Just, just the thought of just not being able to ever hug them it, or just have a meal with them, you know, knowing that you're going to get out and everything will be okay. Just So that does cross your mind that, okay, I might have, this might have went, gotten to the point where these walls are all I'm going to see through the rest of my life. So time goes by real slow when you're in that, that mode of thinking in, in the cell. So... It's like watching your life flash before your eyes. You remember every kiss that you gave your mom. You remember every hug. You remember your family. You remember every dinner. And it runs through your head like, you know, that, that will be it. You know, that you're not going to get that again. So it, it's it's tough to deal with at that moment, you know, not knowing. Do you ever, I mean, I know you talk about your family, right? You ever think about that kid now? Like, wow, man, look what I did to him. Look what he went through. You know, it was possible that his mother could have got that call that your son passed away or his son could have grew up without a father, right? And I understand prison politics, right? And it's sad that we live that life, man, that we, you know, we live this life where violence is just at an all-time high where we take a young man like you who went to prison when he was 29 years old. And in that moment for your gang, you almost threw your whole life away. You almost said, you know what? This is it. I came to prison with 10 years, and now I'm going to die here. At 29 years old, I'm going to spend the next yeah. maybe 40, maybe 50 years. That's a long time of being miserable in prison. And then you would have had to continuously live that prison life. And maybe someday you might have you know, been the shot caller. That's all you had left. And I talk about that in my book about Stevie Burr, that he had nothing left. That He had a life sentence. All he had was the keys to the car. He wanted to have the keys to the car. He wanted to be the king of the yard because everything else was gone. He could never change that. Forever gone. Life gone. And in that moment, man, you almost blew your whole life. Right? Yeah. Everything. So answer that one question. Do you ever think about that guy? you ever feel bad about what you did? All the time. Uh, what's crazy is that, you know, uh, as I was in transit, uh, leaving actually ready you know to be released 
um, somebody remembered that that incident. He he was getting out a couple weeks later. He was going to the FTC. He was waiting for halfway house. I wasn't there and getting halfway house. But uh, he says, "Aren't you that guy that was in the smooth <clears throat> when that kicked off in the cage?" And I was, I was like, I was like. I tried to get like what year and this and that. He said, "Oh, you know, on, on 2012, around 2012." He's like, "Oh, I was like, yeah." He's like, "He's like, yo, that dude did uh, uh did you hit up?" He said something about that he was in Tucson, and uh, he something about he had all this surgery, he had a lot of medication that he had to take, and he just he didn't like walk right. He didn't work out much anymore, and. Um, he was still doing time and I was getting out. So that kind of hit different. That was a little bit uh, unsettling. So I, at that point, I felt like I didn't deserve to get out, you know, um, because he was still doing time and from what I, what I did to him and I'm actually getting out and he's still serving a sentence the way that he is now, whatever issue he's going through, you know, physically, so I, I, I felt really guilty actually just getting out of prison knowing that that had happened and he's still in. So. Well, at least you feel it, man. At least, you know, you know what it feels like to be in that position and to be able to be like, wow, man, I feel bad about what I did. I think that means a lot. I think it says a lot about your character. 